Okay, you seriously can't open up another one of these game essays with a history lesson. In the... No. When? No. The first? Seriously, Taryn, come on. I thought you were getting paid to write. No, okay, just do the history lesson. Dragon Bane is a fantasy tabletop role-playing game from those incredible Swedes at Free League. And thank Christ this one has a name us English-speaking YouTubers can pronounce without pissing off the keyboard linguists in the comment section. Vasen, Merkborg, Vasen, Versen, Vasen, Merkborg, Ork, Merkborg, Morkborg, Merkborg, Morkborg, Vasen. For this one, we're keeping the backstory short. While I was trying to put together a timeline from what I could find, nothing in English was really detailing edition changes, and I don't have the Swedish fluency to verify what I was seeing. If anyone has put the work in on that, I'd love for you all to let me know down in the comments. But anyway, so this is a really rough summary here. Dragon Bane has been the most popular role-playing game in Sweden for decades. Its history goes all the way back to 1982, when Thomas Björklund of Target Games, also known as Adventurespiel, created the first edition of Drakkar och Demoner, which was essentially a translation of Chaosium's magic world and their basic role-playing system. This much is covered in the Dragon Bane preface. In 1985, Target introduces the second edition, which I've read deviated in more significant ways from its birth roots. Unfortunately, change logs weren't exactly standard practice for games back then, and all these versions were written in wrong English. Two years later, they simultaneously released Drakkarok Demoner's third edition, as well as an expert version, which opted for a D20-based roll under system instead of the D100 base of Magic World. This expert version seems to be widely accepted as the preferred version of classic Drakkarok Demoner, similar to Moldvay's basic expert was for classic D&D. The 90s wouldn't be a kind decade for target games. Despite them releasing the 4th edition of Drakarok Demoner and branching out from fantasy with the Gnostic horror game Cult and the post-apocalyptic wasteland RPG Mutant, throughout this decade, Target Games experienced significant financial hardship and would ultimately go defunct in 1999 when they were folded into an IP holdings company. Eventually, Drakarok Demoner gets licensed out to a developer called Riot Minds, and their editions of the game would fall closer to D&D conventions such as character levels instead of the more granular, narrative-based advancements of editions past. The editions created by Riot Minds seem to have never quite hit for the DoD fanbase, and development of the IP seems to have stopped on their end. Projects have popped up here and there around the Drakarok Demoner IP, but nothing seems to have come to fruition. When it seemed like Drakarok Demoner was going to fade into gaming obscurity, it got some hope in the form of one of the best TTRPG developers in the world. In 2022, Free League obtained the license and announced that they were working on the next edition of Drakarok Demoner, and they were also going to be bringing it to the US under the title of Dragonbane. Their 2023 Kickstarter campaign raised over $750,000 to revive the IP, and they've managed to create one of the most appealing products on the entire TTRPG market. When I was getting to know this game in its setting, it felt like the first time I ever read Lord of the Rings. It's a childlike wonder evoked by its promise of mirth and mayhem, and this game has been delivered with damn near perfect execution. We've been pretty lacking on low magic fantasy, and Dragonbane is a welcome breath of fresh air in an industry where high magic super fantasy dominates. Not only does this game hit, the product line is, in my opinion, the best in the business. Free League's quality is simply unmatched when it comes to print production, and the core box elevates the standard for TTRPG starter kits to a level only rivaled by Pathfinder's starter set. When you're running a game that looks this stylish, you know you're going to need to up your game mastery gear to keep up. Luckily, the sponsor of today's video has got you covered. Frontier Wargaming is launching their Kickstarter for their game master cases, one of which I'm the extremely proud owner of. A few months back, they sent me a custom game master case with a Land of the Blind logo etched onto it. I know, slick, right? Frontier has an established reputation in the miniature painting hobby for their line of portable paint stations, and now they're entering the realm of luxury game master screens. This three-panel case has eight shelving slots along with outer compartments and a middle book compartment with straps to secure a letter-sized tome or a few zine-sized books. The open shelves are magnetically lined and the box shelves are perfect for holding dozens of 16mm and smaller dice, like the Forbidden Jolly Ranchers from the Dragon Bane box set. There's also a collapsible wooden dice tower and leather tray, as well as a wireless charging stand for your phone or tablet to keep the ambient jams going throughout those long sessions. They keep the whole station well lit with this brilliant USB powered LED light and the case is magnetically lined for you to pin up notes or whatever you need to the wall of the book compartment. They package the entire thing in this handsome canvas bag that I've already managed to spill coffee on and it can be etched with a custom design of your choice. 
Go check out their Kickstarter from their Game Master's Chest using the link below. Thank you so much to Frontier Wargaming for sponsoring this video, and with that, let's get back to Dragonbane. To give it a short summary, this edition of Dragonbane is a d20-based roll under system with tactical grid-based movement and targeting. Rolling low is good here, so rolling a 1 results in a dragon, which is the crit, and rolling a 20 results in a demon, the fumble. It draws tons of its mechanical roots from another of Free League's games, Forbidden Lands. However, it acts entirely differently in operation. In a lot of ways, I feel Dragonbane is a sort of Forbidden Lands second edition, with the expansion on character expression and rules reduction, but both justify their own existences. While Forbidden Lands leans in extremely heavily on the more survivalist, tracking heavy mechanics, Dragonbane shucks all that to focus on sword and board, low fantasy combat. I actually prefer this vibe in play to not just Forbidden Lands, but even the likes of D&D. You aren't tracking your ammo here as long as you have a container for it. You don't need to track pounds of food and gallons of water. Just make sure that you have your rations and your water skin handy. On the combat crunch index, and yes, we're officially calling it that now, Dragonbane sits below 5e, but still firmly above the likes of Shadow Dark and the Year Zero engine. It hits closer to the type of fantasy I envision when I'm playing a fantasy game, and the damage structure isn't as cartoonishly overblown as it is in super fantasy games. It doesn't reel things back so far as to what I'd call gritty territory, but I think the most damage dice I really saw a monster's action do was 5d6. You won't necessarily be relearning a whole lot if you're already familiar with games like 5e, but you might want to watch out where you're making some assumptions in Dragonbane. But it's more than just the damage structure. Even the action economy says a lot about the genre. The rhythm of a fight feels entirely different with this Forbidden Land style initiative in a way that really has to be experienced to get why they do this system. Each round, you draw your initiative from a deck of 10 cards, numbered 1 to 10. The turn order starts at 1, and ascends to whoever had the next lowest number. You have an action in combat, which you can take either on your turn when you come up in the initiative order, or reactively to something else's action to defend yourself. Whenever an attack hits you, you can dodge or parry the attack reactively, which uses your action. Dodging allows you to move up to two squares if you pass, and cancels the attack's hit. Parrying allows you to reduce the damage of the attack if you pass. However, if the attack's damage exceeds your weapon's durability, the weapon breaks. Notice how it's not more action economy, it's less? I know how much of a perceived loss this reduced action economy can be, but the rounds are so fast and this decision making is so interesting, you really don't feel much loss here. I originally thought that this was going to be the non-starter that killed my interest in this game, but it feels like it actually expands on the tactical decision making you'll be doing rather than removing strategy. It's kind of funny how much more TTRPGs feel like action games when you cut down on the action economy. Because the initiative changes every round, you aren't stuck in a particular game loop. I'll kind of illustrate what I mean here. Here my character has drawn a 7, and the goblin drew a 2. In this situation, I'm likely going to use my action to parry or dodge the attack the goblin throws out if they confirm a hit on me. If they don't, I'm going to use my action to attack it. Next round, I drew a 3, and the goblin drew a 4, so now I'm in a position to put the goblin on the defensive or reserve my action if I'm looking a bit low on hit points. You can run with the gamble and take your action earlier to try and kill off an enemy, but that would leave you open to attack. This moment in the round where you've used your action and now you know you can't do anything against hostilities is an interestingly tense period. In some ways, being later in the initiative order is a benefit because you're able to see how things are unfolding before you decide to use your action. This is a really cool mechanical expression for the fiction of a fight that rewards patience and planning. This is one of the few times I felt individual initiative was more than just a convenient sorting of turns that people would be used to. It's an extremely intentional decision to reward tactical planning. On paper, this might not seem like anything special, but in practice, you're going to feel tension towards using any action in a fight because everything comes at a cost and you can't predict the order of the next round. The important thing to note here is that monstrous enemies are assumed to hit. Most of these attacks aren't able to be dodged or parried, meaning the threat gets escalated. Monsters are unique here because the game doesn't consider things like goblins to be monsters. Those creatures are still rolling for their attacks, but the dragons, demons, whites, and other monsters are given more weight by not needing to prove that they would hit. Due to its damage structure, there's less mathing overall. Heroes aren't getting increases to hit points very often, if at all, meaning that monsters are all kept at a relatively similar power. Each monster gets a lineup of tactics that they can employ, also keeping things less predictable for the GM. 
It's an eased mental load rather than having you decide whether you should use two claws and a bite attack or an extremely specific spell list. This is the kind of thing I feel makes Marshalls more interesting in a fantasy TTRPG. It's not additional characteristics to weapons in the attack action, it's quantifiably less material to Grok, and the initiative order itself is giving the rhythm of war an organized chaos. I'm always going to prefer deep puddles to shallow oceans, especially when it comes to designing third-party material. Dragonbane's combat is a fathomless bucket, and I'm unbelievably excited to explore its depths. There's three big factors in character creation, your kin, profession, and age. Kin grants a unique ability that isn't available to any other option. The professions essentially only grant a starting package for your character, providing a heroic ability, some starting gear, and a lineup of skills that you'll be choosing from for your initial six skill trainings. For your stats, stat generation is 46 dropped the lowest six times, allowing you to move these stats around as you like. You use these scores to create a base chance, which tells you what you need to roll equal to or below on the d20 using the indicated skill, which can be increased through training and advancement. Now, your trained skill count comes from your age, which can also modify your stats. Young gets eight trained skills and a plus one bonus to agility and constitution. Adult is the middle of the road with 10 trained skills and no stat change. Old is the wisest of all with 12 trained skills and a plus one bonus to intelligence and willpower but they have a minus two to strength, agility, and constitution. You must pick at least six of your trained skills from your profession loadout, but the others are entirely up to you. If you're trained in a skill, your base chance during character creation is doubled. This is an extremely important step here, because outside of character creation, you won't be getting training in skills or weapons. You'll have to actually use those skills to better yourself narratively through the advancement system. Advancement is more nuanced than levels gained in a class. Whenever you roll a dragon or a demon using a skill, you check the box next to the skill. After a session, you can roll a d20 against the scores you have a check next to. If the result of your roll exceeds the skill level, it increases by 1, capping at 18. If you hit 18 with a skill level, you can then gain a heroic ability. An important thing to notice here is the lack of hit point scaling per level. You can take the robot. Ah! You can take the robust heroic ability to increase your overall hit points, but other than that, you should probably get used to seeing your hit points remain in the teens or single digits. This keeps most enemy attacks in a pretty threatening range, and boy does it ever make playing mage kinda scary. That's an extremely brief synopsis of character creation, and I'll do a video here soon covering building a dragon main character, but for the purposes of this video, I'd like to just kinda move on and talk about how it really captures its tone and themes. So, Dragon Bane markets itself as mirth and mayhem roleplay, which Thomas Ehrenstam defines as a mix of silliness and brutal challenge. This description feels like most fantasy dungeon crawler TTRPGs I've played, but I'm just glad to see that they've actually embraced the lighthearted and comedic aspects of these kinds of games. There's just like way too many TTRPGs that take themselves entirely too seriously in their rulebooks, which I've never personally been able to keep face with. If you're someone that sat at one of my tables, you probably know what I mean by this, but I like to describe the games that I run as sort of Adventure Time-esque, and I've never really felt at home at tables that go for the dramatic heartstring tugs. No shade on tables that do, but I've just always preferred games where I'm slinging spells and hitting stuff with a sword. With the mirth, there's a real whimsy with this thing that evokes a Tolkien-esque feel without being Tolkien. I feel that this is mostly down to two things. It's low magic and distance from the traditional class fantasy of Dungeons and Dragons. Dragonbane's world scope is condensed to a region known as the Misty Vale. The Vale is a semi-reclaimed wasteland similar to Hyrule in Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom. It has a history dating back over a thousand years that details a beautifully tropey legend that will feel like familiar fantasy fare. The adventure book in the core box set has 11 different adventures that form a collectathon campaign and reveal this legend centered around the clash between dragons and demons. I don't want to spoil anything, but there's story-based explanations of game mechanics for both player and GM within the first 10 pages. It teaches you by playing, similar to Pathfinder's starter kit. There was a particular favorite of mine for the GM, where it teaches you that by spending a shift, they're able to get information, so like they're literally spending their time to do this, rather than the more loose structures of what you get with something like a 5e or whatever, where it's like, oh, I guess we're just going to make a check for whatever you're doing right here, right? This is all teaching the GM how they can give specific interactive actions more weight in the game, rather than just pushing that off on a roll. 
Again, I don't want to spoil anything because the Misty Vale is a fantastic starter region for a new game, and I love the idea of keeping the world concept down to something this small. Another perk is, this setting can be plopped into any fantasy world that you have imagined. They didn't build out a whole world for you, they built a magical region with a giant Lands Unknown sign beyond the surrounding mountains. They give you all you need to know to get a feel for the system core with the Misty Veil, and if you decide to continue on with your own homebrew game, you can build out beyond those borders. And this is the game with the duck people. I love the fact that the mallard are a thing here. I can't really explain it, but there's like this 80s nostalgia that I, I, I don't know what it is. They just, they remind me of bad CGI and VCRs. The humanoid duck character has been a thing since Greg Stafford created the rules in Glorantha for Chaosium. After the carryover, the ducks were tweaked to suit this newly emerging game world while Dragonbane's voice was forming, similar to how basically every fantasy TTRPG includes elves and dwarves from Norse folklore. Since there's no assumed world for Dragonbane, what you're given here with the kin are more vanilla options, with the mallards serving as the mirth amongst the mayhem. I suspect we might see an official campaign setting book in the future because there kind of is one already, or well, a few. While this game was in the hands of Target Games, there was a world built out for it known as Alter, and the expectation was that you were on the continent of Arab. This resulted in a line of fantasy action adventure supplements branded with Arab Alter. This line has been seemingly shucked for Free League's Dragonbane, but I dug up a funny factoid and I need this in the script to set this up. One of the regions in Arab is the hostile lands of barbarians called Barbia, and when Target created a book for it, someone made the bold choice to go with Barbie Pink on the cover. Whoever this was, thank you. The TTRPG industry could seriously benefit from more self-aware content like this. Okay, and then go figure, I was literally getting this thing put together and grabbing an asset from a book whenever I see this Kickstarter popped up. Uh, this is by Helm Gas. It looks like it just funded as of March 8th, uh, and they're going to be bringing Arab Alter to... Uh, Three leagues version of <laughs> Dracarok Demoner. So uh, I don't know if this means that we're going to get an English version, but these are the guys that make cult now. So like this thing is definitely going to happen. And they do work with Modifius in order to get cult over here to the US. So uh, I don't know, but dope. There was also the land of Trudvang when Dracarok Demoner was in the hands of Riot Mines. Trudvang was more inspired by Scandinavian folklore than the pulp fantasy of Arab Altar, but there still seems to be demand for this setting to this day. Unfortunately, Trudvang appears to be yet another victim of 5e's Reign of Terror, if the Modesto cover text from their 2017 crowdfunding campaign tells you anything. Looping this all back around, the Mallard and Wolfkin are essentially the only things implying a default setting. Everything else is fairly bog standard fantasy fare, so if you're looking for a low magic system to help accommodate the world you have envisioned, seriously give Dragonbane some thought. A majority of characters won't have access to magic, the focus of the fight is on physical actions, and character progression is distanced from the more gamey feel of traditional TTRPG levels. Now, with that out of the way, let's get to my critiques. This is the part that I have to preface by saying I adore this system. I, honestly, I'm stoked to play it any time, but I'm a firm believer in giving everything an even hand. I think you should be willing to discuss the negatives of anything you like, so know that this whole section comes from wanting to see this game made even better. I'm also in the position where I think most of my criticisms are nitpicks and preferences rather than anything damning, but I try to leave no stone unturned. As gorgeous as the art and layout is, part of me thinks that these beautiful spreads do a disservice in information distribution. Each of the professions gets a whole page of coverage, despite the mechanical core maybe being a quarter or a third of the page. This is mostly to give Egercrun's stunning character designs room to breathe, and I wouldn't want it sacrificed but I couldn't help but notice how often I was flipping back and forth through pages just to figure out how to make a character in my first go-round with the book. It's also noticeably inconsistent with how it lists weapon damage and stat blocks. For example, the skeleton's weapons indicate which damage die is rolled, but the minotaur's two-handed axe doesn't. I'm guessing this decision was made because the skeleton is run as an NPC rather than a monster, but then you get to the typical NPC's table on page 105 and none of these have their weapon damage dice indicated, despite having an ungodly amount of space to do so. This inconsistency is really odd for referencing, and I felt like a madman flipping through the book during solo play just to negotiate what was happening. There's extremely few magic items, aside from what's basically just detailed in adventures. I can't really give an example here because that would spoil some of the important story beats, but the power of these items might even be a tad underwhelming, I know that magic items are sort of a D&Dism, 
but I know that this could be a turnoff for some people who really love that aspect of dungeon crawler fantasy, especially when the game doesn't give you a guide to making some of your own. This goes double for the monsters. It's a pretty scarce bestiary in just the core box, and the number of monster sandies doesn't sync up with the lore and for what the adventure book calls for. For example, the harpy is a monster that the book indicates is usually always attacking as a flock, and the adventure book has a scenario that calls for at least three of them, which is why it's a little bit disappointing that there's only one harpy standee in the core box and none in the standee expansion. I wouldn't mind dropping another $30 on a box of just standees of some of the smaller creatures because of situations like this. Getting more goblins, skeletons, zombies, and the beasts would be a really welcome addition, especially because I've been gravitating more towards standees and tokens over miniatures here lately. It's also, unfortunately, a bit of ally punishing in several aspects of the game, which is something that I would personally just flat out ignore at my tables. This is mostly relegated to optional rules, but I did want to mention it here because it is present, and I don't think I've ever talked about my preferences regarding ally punishment. I've never felt games that take chance-based failure to the point of punishment are fun. If you had a bad roll, that's really where I think the suck can stop. If I'm punished for doing something reckless and dumb, that's one thing, but punishing someone else because I didn't roll the right number always feels bad in practice. Doing things like accidentally hitting an ally with a ranged attack or affecting them with a damaging spell you cast never makes anyone at the table stoked. I'm glad this isn't baked into the game as an intended rule for play, but I'm always baffled as to why it would even be included as an option. There's also an extremely minor critique I have for the solo supplement in the box set. Alone in Default Breach works as a solo experience and I've played multiple sessions with it, but I feel like there's less meat to bite onto here than what I'm personally used to with solo RPGs. It absolutely delivers on the Dragonbane core, but it feels more like a solo experience for people who have already been behind the GM screen. You have a procedurally generated path, which means that you can run these missions a billion times over and never get the same layout. However, new players could be confused by the idea of having to imagine the rooms and their elements themselves. I guess it's not really a critique, but like an observation or worry. I'm not quite sure, but I believe that Dragonbane has one of the best system cores for solo roleplaying currently on the market, and it just needs to find a format to really stretch its legs. I don't know that Alone in Default Breach was really it, but I know that there's going to be something out there for this eventually. All right, so just wrapping this thing up. I believe Dragonbane has what it takes to be one of the bigger TTRPGs in this hobby and become a mainstay for a huge percentage of the TTRPG fandom. Because of this, I'm going to try to make this game as approachable as possible and give some homebrewers tools to work with to make more content. Right now, I have three videos already uploaded and unlisted. My Patreon sponsors will be able to see them right now, but they'll go public here soon. The first is going to be a tier list of the various kin like I mentioned earlier, the second being a character creation video, and the third detailing my observations as a third party creator whenever I was making my own homebrew for Dragonbane. It's going to be a guide to creating your own professions for this game, at least from my experience from porting over my 5e work. Come check out my Patreon if any of that sounds cool to you. Really really made something killer here, and I hope I was able to pique your interest enough to at least go check out the free quick start link below. If you want to dive in further, I recommend picking up the box set before the hardback rulebook as a softcover version of it's included in there. Other than that, I'd like to thank Frontier Wargaming for sponsoring this video here at the end. Please go check out their Kickstarter for these awesome Game Master cases with the link below so that they know I sent you. Ah! Was that left or right? Fuck. That's gonna look weird. You know what? The dragon stayed up all the way here until the end. I don't know if that's put back up the right way. We're just gonna run with it. But anyways... A huge shout out to my Patreon sponsors for helping me keep the lights on around here and coffee in my blood. You all are absolute heroes. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have more of my life to be stolen from me by Valadro. I hope you all are staying safe, staying healthy, and I'll see you in the next one.